grace. It's one of those big Bible words that we hear about in church, we read about in church, we sing about in church. There are well-known Bible passages that talk about grace. For example, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, that it's by grace you have been saved through faith. Not, not from yourself, it's the gift of God. Or Romans chapter 3, where it says that we have been justified as a gift by His grace. We, we know these verses. In fact, personally, um, when I first became a Christian, man, I read these passages or other passages like them, and I, I knew about grace. I knew I was saved by grace. I affirmed that. I could teach that. I could point out passages like this and tell people, oh, I was saved by grace, but I don't think I fully understood it. I don't think I fully got it. My Christian life was marked by striving and trying harder and trying to live up to and be good enough and prove I was worth it, right? And, and as a result, my emotions were marked by highs and lows as, as I thought I was doing well in my spiritual life. Oh, well, then I felt good about my life. And when I was doing my devotions regularly, I felt good about it. If I hadn't done anything majorly wrong by my own estimation, oh, I felt good about it. But then if I wasn't doing so good, oh, I felt bad about it. And so I had these huge fluctuations and, and this trying to be good enough because I didn't fully get grace. And the reality is, is I knew the words, I just didn't know what they meant. And so what does it mean to be saved by grace? The fact is, is when we understand that, like really deeply down in our gut and our bones, understand that it changes everything. It changes our whole mindset, our whole heart set, changes our relationship, obviously, with God. It changes our relationship with ourselves. changes our relationship with others. So what is grace? And I want to answer that question maybe a little differently than we do sometimes. I want to answer that question by beginning in John chapter 1, verse 14, where the Apostle John writes these words. He says, and the Word became flesh. And we know that part. Maybe we've heard that part. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, what's the Word? We're talking about Jesus becoming flesh. God becoming flesh. So the Word became flesh. He dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, it says, uh, as of the only begotten from the Father. And then here's the phrase I want us to, to focus on. Full of grace and truth. Did you catch that? Like when when John writes this, he says that the word became flesh. We beheld, we saw his glory full of grace and truth. In fact, he goes on in verse 16, just a couple verses later to say, of his fullness we have uh, received even catch this, grace upon grace, like piles and piles of grace, like grace heaped up on grace. Like we have of his fullness we have received grace upon grace, John says. Remember, these are the words of an eyewitness. This is the Apostle John. He was there. He saw Jesus. He experienced Jesus. He walked with Jesus for three and a half years around. He listened to him teach. He knew what the tone of his voice sounded like when he talked. He knew what his eyes looked like and the, the light in his eyes and what it, was, what it was like to just be with him and, and see him. And the way he describes it is grace upon grace. That's his experience. And so as we, as we look at Jesus, what we're seeing is grace in the flesh. And in fact, that's a good way for us to read the Gospels is just to read through Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, the four Gospels that tell the story of Jesus, and read through them and just notice the grace on display. Where do we see the grace of Jesus? How do we see the grace of Jesus? Read through the Gospels and look for that. And what, what we'll see is, as John says, grace upon grace. For example, one of my all-time favorite Bible stories, Luke chapter 7, Jesus is in some city. We're not sure where. He's been invited to dinner um, to Simon the Pharisee's house. And the Pharisees are, you know, the religious elite of the day. They have a lot of popular appeal, and they're the teachers and the rabbis in the local synagogues. Well, Jesus is a visiting rabbi. He's been invited to Simon the Pharisee's house. And as was customary, towns folks gather around. They want to watch the dinner and listen into the conversation. Well, in the midst of this dinner, a very well-known woman from that city uh, is has come to listen in. She's not just any old woman. The text describes her as a notorious sinner. We're not exactly sure what that means. Our best guess is she's a prostitute. And instead of staying in her place on the outside watching this dinner, she breaks ranks and she 
comes to Jesus. And as she approaches Jesus, he's lying down, eating at this, this dinner, and his feet are out behind him because that's the way they ate at these dinners. And she begins to cry, and tears begin to stream down her cheeks, and they begin to drip on Jesus' feet. And his feet are dusty because he didn't even get a customary washing when he was invited to this dinner. And so now it's making a muddy mess on his feet. And she has an expensive vial of perfume. A very expensive perfume. She cracks it open and she begins to pour this perfume out all over Jesus' feet. And she lets down her hair, which was totally inappropriate in public in their culture. And she begins to wipe her his feet with her hair because she hadn't really totally planned on it going like this. And she didn't have a rag. So now she's wiping his feet. And it's this total display of affection and intimacy. And we have to assume that this woman somehow had experienced uh, the love and the goodness of Jesus in, in his time in town. Maybe she heard it in his voice. Maybe she saw it in his eyes. But she knew that she would be treated differently by him. She knew she would be welcomed by him. And that's what gave her the courage to come. And so she comes and she cries and weeps at Jesus' feet. Now, the story, if you read this, Luke chapter 7, it's amazing because of what happens next. Here is Simon the Pharisee. His dinner party has been defiled by this notorious sinner woman. And he is frustrated at this woman. And he wants to condemn this woman and criticize Jesus. Uh, and, and what happens? Well, Jesus defends this woman and criticizes Simon. Um, that, my friends, is grace upon grace. And this woman was right. She experienced grace upon grace in the eyes and the voice and in the welcome of Jesus. Or you see grace upon grace in the life of Jesus in um, Matthew, also known as Levi, one of his disciples who was a tax collector, right? By the Jewish standards, he's a traitor. And not only that, he's greedy because he's using the tax office and charging extra taxes so he can make money. And so here comes Jesus to Matthew and says, come, follow me. And Matthew does. And then Jesus welcomes him into his inner circle as one of his 12 disciples who's going to be like his his ambassadors to the world, and he is welcome. And while we're on tax collectors, think of the well-known story of Zacchaeus. If you're familiar with your Bible or you grew up going to church, you heard the story of Zacchaeus, the short man who climbed a tree to see Jesus when he came to town. Well, Jesus stops at the base of that tree, looks up, and he sees Simon up in the tree, and he says, Simon, Simon, come on down. I'm going to your house for dinner. Crazy grace right there, because here's Jesus uh, supposed to be a rabbi, and in their culture, eating together marked like social equality. So to go to Zacchaeus' house would have been welcoming him back into the community, would have been defending him as a son of Abraham, like as a person who could be welcomed into God's family. And Jesus does that grace upon grace. You see it all over the ministry of Jesus. You hear it in Jesus' description of God, his picture of God in the prodigal son parable. You hear it as a father who runs to welcome his son back home. Uh, grace upon grace. And we see this all over the ministry of Jesus. And that's what um, John is describing when he says, Of his fullness we have all received, even grace upon grace. And the basic definition of grace is undeserved kindness. That is, as one author described it, it's love that stoops. Meaning it's love that stoops down to help you when you can't help yourself. It's love that, that bends down to give you what you couldn't give for yourself and you have no claim on or entitlement to. It's that kind of love that gives you what you don't deserve. As somebody described it, it's gift love. The kind of love that says, I know you can't pay me back and I know you don't deserve it, but, but here, I'm going to give it to you anyhow. That's grace, undeserved kindness. And as we reflect on grace, I think it's terribly important that we, we keep in mind that it's not just niceness, right? Like being nice to somebody, it means that we just don't want to hurt their feelings. We just don't want to upset anyone, right? We, we, we don't want to step on anyone's toes. We don't want to upset the apple cart. Oftentimes when we're nice, it means we pretend everything's good when it's not really good. Well, that's not grace. Grace is stronger than that. Grace doesn't pretend like it's no big deal when a wrong really has been done, and it really is a big deal. Grace doesn't just sweep something under the carpet and, and like, ah, oh, you know, we'll just ignore it. That's not grace. Um, grace refers to the kind of love 
that fully acknowledges the wrong done and yet is kind and generous to you anyhow, even though you don't deserve it. That's grace. It's love with a backbone. It's love that is, is able to say, that was wrong, that hurt, that wasn't good, and yet be generous and kind anyhow. And it's also, I think, when we're processing grace to make sure we emphasize that grace is always personal. That is, it's the action of one person towards another person. It's not mechanical. And sometimes we speak of the doctrine of grace. And that phrase isn't bad and it's not wrong and it's, it's not, certainly not inappropriate. There is a teaching about grace. But, but we can easily hear the phrase doctrine of grace and think in terms of a process, right? Like um, where if I go through the right steps, all of a sudden grace is what comes out, right? Like almost like a giant vending mas machine in the sky where if I, you know, punch in the right buttons and go through the right steps, boom, grace is what I get out of it. And it's just not the way it works. Grace isn't mechanical. Grace is personal. In other words, it's what one person does for another person. He's a gracious person. And that's why John says we, we saw Jesus full of grace. We experienced from him grace upon grace. It's the action of one person for another. In fact, the most quoted passage of by the Bible by the Bible, um, in other words, the passage that the Bible quotes more often than any other passage elsewhere in the Bible is Exodus 34, 6. It's worth memorizing. Exodus 34, 6 is God's own self-description where Moses says, I want to see you, God. I want to really know you and I want to meet you and I want to see you. Um, God says, all right, well here, and he kind of has him you know, get in the rocks and kind of hides in the rocks. He says, I'm going to pass by and you'll, you'll see me when I, after I pass by. And as he passes by, God declares who he is. He describes himself to Moses. And this is what he says in Exodus 34, 6. He says, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. That's God's own self-description. In other words, God says, this is who I am. I am a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And once you hear those words, and, and, and then as you continue to read through the Old Testament, you'll see those words everywhere, all throughout the Psalms, all throughout the prophets, all throughout the Old Testament. The, the writers of the Old Testament hear God's self-description and they say that's who, who God is and that's how we need to know him. We need to know him as merciful and compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and overflowing in steadfast love. Well, when Jesus comes on the scene and John writes about him in John 1.1, 1, 1, he's echoing those words. He's picking up that, that passage and he's saying, look, when God became flesh, that's what we experience. We experience the God of merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Of his fullness we have all received, even grace upon grace. And that's who God is. And that's what grace means. And as I said, when I first started following Jesus, I knew the word grace. I, I understood what it was about, right? Like I had heard it. I had read Ephesians 2, 8 and Romans chapter 3. I knew the words, but I didn't get it. Well, shortly after my wife and I got married, we were house sitting at one of our college professor's homes, and it was a Bible college, and he had bookshelves around the house, and I was into books, so I started skimming his bookshelves. Well, there on the shelf was this little, thin, tiny little book titled, Being Good Enough Isn't Good Enough. And as I read that title, it just struck a chord in my heart and my soul because for four years I had been trying to be good enough. I had been trying to please God. I had been striving to prove I was worth his love or say thank you for his generous gift. And even though I knew the word grace, I felt like I had been trying to be good enough. And that little book and that little title struck a chord in my soul. So I pulled that book off the shelf and I opened it up and I began to read and the words of that book were, were just like a light to my eyes and a lightning bolt to my heart. And it just captivated me. And it was a tiny little book. I read that whole book in one night and it changed my life. Because all of a sudden, for the first time, I understood what it really meant to not have to try to be good enough, but to be welcomed by a gracious God to himself. That God is a gracious person and he had welcomed me home. And he didn't do it because I was good enough. He did it because of his merciful and gracious love. And that 
is what grace is all about. It's about being welcomed by God, our merciful and gracious Father who loved us literally to death. So my friends, I pray that you will understand what it means to be saved by grace and that your life will be changed because of that. And you will know that you are deeply and dearly loved by God himself, the infinite creator and a gracious father for you. Hey, thanks for checking out the Bible in Life here on YouTube. If you want to check out more, I'll link some other videos up on the screen. And just know that this is a listener-supported show. And to all of you who are my patrons over on my Patreon page or who donate through my website, thanks a ton for making this show possible. God bless you guys, and we'll talk again soon.